Repeat after me. I bring more than diversity. I bring irreplaceable perspectives. Hey friends, my name is Whitney and I'm the host of Impostrix Podcast, the show that validates professionals of color navigating imposter syndrome and racial toxicity in their career. Join us and be validated. You got this. Welcome back. Welcome back. This is Whitney Lee, and I'm so excited to have y'all with me. This is the season two premiere of Impostrix Podcast. I'm joined today by Autumn Walker, and I'm looking forward to getting into this conversation. Autumn is a therapist, and she is all about helping Black women navigate imposter syndrome. And I stumbled upon her Instagram page one day when I was doing some research on Instagram around imposter syndrome and blackness, black culture, black people. And she popped up. She has a fantastic page with all sorts of tips around how to navigate imposter syndrome. So I had to have her on. So welcome to the show, Autumn. Thank you, Whitney. I am so excited to be here with you today with the audience and talking about something that I'm truly passionate about, imposter syndrome in particular, um, the experiences of Black women with imposter syndrome and combining both mental wellness as well as personal development in order for us to confidently go after those purpose-driven goals that I believe will ultimately set us free from a lot of negative stereotypes, messaging, and biases around Black women's identity work, um, and so that we can really fully embrace our authentic selves and, and go after what we truly want and deserve. So, so excited awesome. to be here with y'all today. Um, as she mentioned, I'm Autumn, and I identify as a Black woman, she, her, hers. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So I think the first thing that I want to jump into with you as we kind of reacclimate to the show and to these conversations around imposter syndrome is what for you in your practice as a therapist, what are you seeing? How would you describe imposter syndrome based on what you're, you yourself, but also your clients and the people that you're working with, what they're experiencing? I would describe imposter syndrome as a reinforced belief system in which we see our worth and value as inadequate, which can lead to internal conflict and shows up as self-doubt, self-criticism, and even just overall a lower sense of self-concept. So I, I see folks for a number of different things. However, when imposter syndrome does show up, it typically shows up when my clients are in a, a period of transition, especially at work, when it's time to present their skills and their talents in a, in a more promoted atmosphere. You started out by saying a, a reinforced belief. And mm -hmm. I like that language because, you know, I, I had done some research, of course, on imposter syndrome and learned about imposter phenomenon being coined um, in relation to a study done where it was primarily white, middle class, high achieving women who were being studied. And shortly after that, I read a couple of books. One of them um, was I'm Not Yelling by Elizabeth Leba. Mm -hmm. And I started this podcast. And as I've been conversing with people of color, it's become more and more clear to me that unlike what many people say, which is that imposter syndrome is an internal affliction that we're dealing with, that I really think it's an external manifestation of white supremacy that we are internalizing. That framework really changes for me how I deal with my own imposter experiences. And so even down to the language, like I use the words imposter syndrome generally because it's, a, it's something that people can identify. Right. If I'm saying imposter experiences, nobody's going to know what I'm talking about. That's not going to come up on SEO searches. Like none of that is it, it's not going to ring a bell. But 
I really think that for me, that's the experience that I have. The experience of um, feeling like an imposter or being treated like an imposter because of how I'm showing up and maybe how I'm showing up isn't how others might expect for me to show up. Or maybe I'm feeling as though me showing up in my authentic self is other than how other people are showing up in this space. And I'd love to hear from you as somebody that is really trying to work particularly with Black women around imposter syndrome, what your thoughts are around how our race and our cultural and ethnic identity play into imposter syndrome. That was so beautifully said with me. I, you know, thank you for, you know, sharing with me even just a little bit of your own personal experience in, in regards to recognizing like, oh, you know, this, how this impacts you and, and how this shows up for you on a systemic level. Because it wasn't until I started really diving into this work when I started to realize that there are some cultural and systemic elements connected to this, you know, phenomenon. When I began my company, The Soul Reasons, back in 2020, it actually was a call to action against the social injustice that was running rampant through the, you know, through our country at that time. I, you know, I coined it. I don't know if anyone else coined it, but I coined it the Red Summer of 2020 when, you know, we took to the streets to protest on, um, you know, to honor George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the other countless Black lives that were wrongfully taken. And I realized that I was having some some emotional response to all of the things that were happening. And I decided to, like, you know, really push for more conversation around mental health and racial trauma. Mm. And, and then through my own personal development, I started to realize how for myself, what I was also experiencing in that moment was in, in actually going back into time, I realized that there has been a historical pattern of me feeling other than, you know, othered, marginalized, um, like I don't belong, inadequate, minimized, um, ignored, and how that started to ultimately shape how I see myself. And mm. through more self-work, therapy, um, prayer, all the things, I realized that, oh, snap, the reason why I've had such a lower sense of self or, or ultimately a, you know, lower self-esteem it's because I've been, I've been measuring my worth by these standards that the mm -hmm. system has put in place for so long and reinforced for so right. long as well. Hence the reinforced belief because there are different things set in place that will ultimately confirm some of these beliefs, you know, some of these biases and, and stereotypes that we begin to internalize. So once I realized, like, oh, this is a thing, <laughs> I, I pivoted. I switched gears for the sole reason. And I started to talk about this a little bit more deeply, and in particular with Black women. Because as Malcolm X has, you know, been often quoted, the most disrespected person in America is the Black woman. And there's nothing but truth to that. Because, and we'll, we'll see it through and through, um, it throughout history, throughout generations. And so I recognize that our experiences with imposter syndrome is very unique and very tailored to our own stories and histories. So for me personally, when it comes to imposter syndrome and, and systemic oppression and, and also cultural norms, I recognize that it is because of the way systems work, it seems so subtle. You mm. know, it seems so normalized. This is just how it is. This is the way it is. And I know that I'm coming up against some folks who may disagree because, again, they may see this is just too radical. <laughs> you know, this is just yeah. too radical of a thinking. You know, to, to it's just too radical of an idea or concept. However, like, if you really peel back the layers, if you really peel back the layers, um, you really start to see that a lot of these um, feelings of inadequacy and feeling disqualified and or ignored or marginalized didn't just happen out of nowhere. 
They didn't just happen out of nowhere. It, it definitely has some deep rooted beginnings and it often always turned back to the systems. Yeah, I was just reflecting as you were saying this on a recent experience that I had had reading a book. I'm not going to name the book. The book is a great book, but I really struggled with with it. And it's um, a book that talks about how we can show up to create change within our communities and within ourselves and introduces a new framework to do that. And this book was recommended to me by a good friend of mine as an example of thought leadership mm-hmm. and an example of moving away, decolonizing really our own interpersonal um, relatedness with others, the interconnectedness of ourselves. So I'll name the book. It's Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. I love the book. It's a great book, but it was really difficult for me to read. And the reason why I thought about it is because I spoke with a mentor. Um, This mentor happens to be friends with Adrienne Marie Brown. I did not know that. But I started talking about it being like, oh, this book is so hard to read. I feel like she was high when she wrote it. I don't know how to grasp all the concepts. And it's just been really difficult for me. And my mentor pointed out to me that I'm reading this book as a scholar Hmm. and that that's not what the intention of the book was. And that instead, the, you know, try reading the book as a storybook. Because the reason, one of the reasons why this book was difficult for me to read was the way that it was organized. I realized that I am so deep in, quote, scholarly work and legal work, legal legal writings, because I'm an attorney, that I'm looking for a specific formula of how words in this type of book should appear on the page. And I'm over here thinking... These, like, she's talking way over my head. Like, I am not qualified to read this stuff. I don't know what's going on here. And these are the same thoughts that I had in law school when I was learning how to read um, legalese and when I was learning how to be in these lawyer professional environments and getting a feel for how these people talk and how they relate to one another and that Back then, I had this feeling of imposter syndrome because I didn't speak the language. And because I didn't speak the language, I didn't feel smart. I didn't feel qualified to be there. I felt like somebody accidentally let me into the school. And now I'm having to like figure it out. And so it dawned on me after this conversation with my mentor that I'm in a process of unlearning Mm. um, some of the ways that we relate to each other in what we consider professional environments and that the word itself professional is a colonized word and that the way that that I approached this particular book you know I some people may be familiar with Adrienne Marie Brown and in my mind she is like she's real high up on a pedestal for how she has vocalized some of these um thoughts and ideas that are not new but that are being presented in this way. And because she's up on a pedestal, like the, the, the pedestal that I have in my mind, um, because of the culture, because of the systems, because of the institutions, like my mind is automatically thinking, okay, the book is gonna look like this. It's gonna read like this. It's gonna have very clear chapters. It's gonna have very clear, you know, topic sentences and all of these things, but it's not. Adrienne Marie Brown's writing is very much she's having a thought process and writing down the thought process and then sending it to be published. Wow. It's almost like reading her journal type of thing, mm-hmm. um, which is so new for me. And so it's really over the past month as I've been getting into her work, it's been a journey of like frustration of I'm not smart enough to read this. Mm-hmm of let me go back to my roots. Let me read this like a story. Let me take the magnifying glass off of every single word, trying to find the hidden, under like there's nothing hidden. It's just the words that she's writing. 
let me take her off the pedestal because she's not trying to be there. She's just writing down her thoughts, you know, and it's been a very interesting experience. And, and so for some reason, when you were talking, I immediately kind of went to that experience because it's, it's almost, it's a reverse of feeling imposter-ish because now I'm so far on one side of the, I don't know, the, the work world, the work life. I've also really been struggling recently with the word organizer. I, when I went into law school, considered myself a community organizer. And now 13, 14 years later, I do not consider myself an organizer, which it's just not true that I'm not an organizer. So part of me reading this book and and in other works um, has been like, I'm not an organizer. Like I shouldn't be reading this. I Because for me, organizers look like X, Y, Z. And that's not me. I'm not doing those things. And so even feeling imposter syndrome around the titles mm-hmm. that I'm giving myself or other people are giving me because – I, it doesn't match how I think the things are supposed to be, but acknowledging that how I think is what's been indoctrinated into me. Like it's not, I didn't like, somebody taught me that this is what X, Y, Z needs to look like. You know, this isn't something that's coming inherently from within. Mm -hmm. So it's been, it's, I've really, even over the last couple of months had a really interesting kind of experiences with imposter syndrome. Wow. And now we're just from you saying that we're seeing how intricate and complex imposter syndrome really is. And that's really what I also try to encourage people to understand that it's not just some colloquial trend that is being tossed around on social media, on the blogs. Imposter syndrome is deep and it has layers and it has so many different colors and spectrums attached to it. We're still scratching the surface on the real thing that is happening, that is pushing and driving imposter syndrome. And you said a key word there that I really want to highlight, and that's unlearn. Because when we are going through this process of overcoming imposter syndrome and becoming imposter syndrome free, we are literally unlearning. And that can sometimes pose a a sense of crisis. Like, what, what is going on? Who am I? <laughs> you know, is, is this really me? Is, is this not me? Like, how did I get myself here? So self-compassion is going to be number one. Anytime we're talking mm. about change, anytime we're talking about getting deeper and learning ourselves and being able to replace certain or uproot certain things and replant and restore seeds that are ultimately more aligned with who you are and or who you, you know, who you are destined to be. So that unlearning process when it comes to imposter syndrome is very critical, which is why I also am encouraging people to understand that un- overcoming imposter syndrome is not something to do independently. So I shout out to your mm. mentor <laughs> for <laughs> graciously, <laughs> you know, graciously yeah. sh- sh- shedding light on a different point of view, a different alternative. If you do find yourself in any situation in which you are feeling inadequate, um, minimized, other, you know, feeling othered and or invaluable, please make sure that you're reaching out to someone, uh, you know, to really help you process those feelings, those beliefs, those thoughts, any habits or behaviors that are attached to it. Preferably someone who is professional in mental wellness, because if you ask me, everything starts with the mind. I know I can sound a little biased because I am a therapist. And at the same time, there's some truth to it. (laughs) There is a lot of truth. Everything Mm -hmm. we do starts from our mental. Uh, So, you know, that unlearning process is very delicate and it can come with another wave of experiences within itself on top of just trying to you know develop and just become stronger in who you are and more confident in your most authentic self I do find that it's really useful to to have someone um, who is nurturing empathetic understanding and guiding to help you 
navigate those sometimes murky waters within itself. Right. Yeah. And I'll say too, that the things that my mentor were, were saying, they were having me really challenge my thinking even around things like Adrian Marie Brown uses a lot of ecology. She she ties a lot of her teachings to nature and literally how things grow. That's her example for everything is how this shows up in nature. And she also is into science fiction and uses a lot of like science fiction-y things, thoughts, which I, I have nothing to do. I don't know anything about ecology. I know nothing about science fiction. But so my mentor was saying, like, this is the way of indigeneity. Like, this is relying on nature and using nature as an example is not foreign to us as humans. Science fiction, Afrofuturism, you know, these are not foreign concepts. They may be foreign concepts to me. And now why is that? And so it's just been a really interesting, the unlearning piece has been very interesting for me as I really try and decolonize my mind around um, the work Mm -hmm. and not with a critical, like, this is bad, you have colonizer mentality. No, just to be aware so that I can really, when I say things like I want to work within my values so that I can really know and feel and believe what those values are um, instead of using language that maybe I'm just not even familiar with. Like, do I know what these words mean as they're coming out of my mouth type of thing? So, So yeah, I wanted to pivot a little bit because also in your response to my asking about imposter syndrome, you had said that you are seeing in your work with the EAP program Um, a lot of people experiencing imposter syndrome as they're making transitions in work. And um, one of the things also that I think is important for us to talk about is that there's a difference between being nervous because you're doing something new or because you're growing or stretching and the feeling of I'm not good enough. And so I wonder if you would talk to us a little bit about how you work with people who are experiencing the imposter syndrome um, when they're in transition or when they're doing something new and how you help them uh, reframe the experience and the internal processing that they're doing. The first thing that is always important in the work that I do is validation. Because that's all we all ever want. We just want to be seen, we want to be heard, and we want to be understood. So the first thing I typically do um, when working and partnering with those clients is validating them and allowing them to understand that their feelings are real, their thoughts are real, and trying my very best not to judge and or shame them because it's already heavy stuff. As we already discussed how imposter syndrome is actually very deep, intricate, emotional, um, just an emotional experience. Secondly, like I mentioned before, everything starts with the mind. I like to get to the root. I'm a root kind of person. I want to know (laughs) where did this start? Let's talk about childhood. (laughs) Nine times out of ten. 10 times out of 10, um, we receive a lot of messages around our worth and or what is categorized as worthy, valuable, successful in childhood. That's a lot of, that's where we really start to, to understand and put, put pieces together around what that looks like for us. Then once we're able to really recognize what, what, what happened in those formative years, we start to we start to substitute. What's a, we got to get flexible because this is real. Your emotions are real. Your experience is real, and we want to make sure we acknowledge that. And at the same time, there there is some distortion happening here. A lot of yes, there's some distortion happening here. So we got to find some kind of flexibility in our thinking, and so that it's not too extreme. We're not going to the extreme. And at the same time, we're not invalidating either. 
So finding something in the middle, replacing some of those, like setting different rules for ourselves, I would say. Setting different rules, different expectations is in, in your own words. Because we got we to gotta stay authentic. We got to stay authentic. Especially when we're talking about just personal development and identity. You know, we have to be very genuine to ourselves. And so, and, and plus that's going to carry you on even after, after the therapy um, session or sessions and, and our time together. So I would say that I would say, you know, first validation, then we're going to get to the root. Where did this start? How did this come about? And now create some alternative rules and or expectations for yourself that are more flexible. And so that you don't feel too bound, too restricted, and or overwhelmed. More than likely, you are going to come across another phase, a moment in your life where you're going to have to grow. <laughs> That's just life, where you're going to have, to, where you're going to put put in a position that is uncomfortable, that is unfamiliar, and you're going to have to have some kind of tool or strategy that is long term. Yeah, I love this because I'm I'm creating a belief system right now, and it's so easy as I'm doing this, as I'm being an entrepreneur to even tell myself, I'm not even entrepreneuring right. Like I'm, I'm not even equipped to be an entrepreneur, you know, like this is the voice in my head. And so when we talk about belief systems, now I'm just like, no, like, so here's my belief system that when I work, I'm going to be doing something that is value aligned with what I want, with, with what I believe in. So it's, it's, that belief system, I loved you saying that because I need to create a belief system for myself that works for me, that is going to sustain me as I live this life. And I'm not even talking about financially. I'm just talking about like I can go to bed at night feeling good about what I spent my day doing. I'm glad that you mentioned your value system. I always encourage people to start there. If you're not like, I don't know what to believe. I don't know who I am. I don't know what to do next. Your value system is the guiding principle. It's going to be just your guiding compass on the directions that you need to take to make sure that when you lay down and you close your eyes and you be able to confidently say that I, I'm proud of what I did today. You know, I'm proud of myself. I, I feel fulfilled. I feel like I'm filled up with meaning. You know, your value system will definitely be a really great inner resource to use to reflect back on that. And the thing about our values are, you know, we all have them. It's just sometimes it takes a little work to identify them and also even, you know, take it a, a step up, making sure that they are incorporated into your day to day routine. So that's another piece that is a part of becoming imposter syndrome free, recognizing your values and making sure that your goals and your visions and your insights are rooted in, in that space, in that place as well. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. I do want to ask you, what do we do about imposter syndrome in work, at work? Mm -hmm. And the term that's come up a lot recently is uh, psychological safety. And so I'm really interested to hear your thoughts. How can we contribute to an emotionally safe work environment? Though I am a strong believer in collectivism and moving in community, I also am a firm believer in everything does start with the self. To really foster emotional safety, I do believe that it is important to already build some layer of protection for you. And that starts with your self-care routine. It really does start with your self-care routine. And self-care doesn't always just mean get your nails did, get your, making sure your hair is locked in. Self-care is also how do you pause? How do you check in with yourself? How are you showing up in your relationships with other people? And how healthy are those? Are you tending to your value system? Are you paying attention and spending time in the things that matter to you outside of work? Because again, capitalism is so labor driven that sometimes we forget that we're a dynamic people, you know, with many different 
things that really drives us and keep us going. Like, how are you engaging in your recreational activities, you know? So I do think it's important that when we're talking about emotional safety in the workplace, we got to start with you first, you know? And because I really do feel like that will help you show up in the workplace with some level, with some kind of armor, you know, some kind of shield, because you're already in a space where you're, you're mentally uh, strong and confident. So when those jabs come at work, you have a shield because you've already been taking care of yourself from the inside out. Now, when it comes to the actual workspace, I'm big on boundaries. So your boundaries are going to teach people how to treat you. Just being able to have the confidence to speak up and to advocate for yourself. And again, that goes right back to being able to take care of yourself because self-care will produce self-confidence because what you're doing is you're saying that I'm able to fulfill my, my needs. That's a confidence booster within itself. So when you're showing up in different, in different spaces, particularly the, the workspace, when something crosses your bounds and or you start to feel mistreated and or taken advantage of setting those boundaries and it, it can be communicated it can be in the way that you show up it can be in the way that you you know limit how much access people have to you whether that's your time your attention your emotions i will say that's a part of you know emotional safety as well setting those boundaries and the last thing that I think in regards to engaging in emotional safety in the workplace, especially as we navigate around imposter syndrome, is going to be building that community. I do think that it's going mm -hmm. to be important that you do have some level of community, whether that's in, in work or out of work. It is important for us to have some level, just to have outlets and having a trusted community is therapeutic within itself. And it can also sometimes provide insight, resources, solutions that could help you overcome whatever obstacle is, is standing in, in the way between you and where you want to be. So I would say those three things, starting with yourself, self-care, being able to fulfill your own emotional and personal needs, um, boundaries, being able to advocate for yourself, and having a solid community. Thank you for those three three points. I had on season one, I was just going back to look at some of my episodes because each of these three elements that you mentioned today are things that I've talked about at depth on the on the podcast and starting with the self-care and actually doing things. And and for me, it is the the racial trauma healing. I talked about that a lot in one of my episodes with Angela, who is also a, a therapist. And then my first two episodes of the season of season one, episodes one and two, were with my sister circle. And they are the ones, they are the community mm -hmm. that lets me know, like, you ain't crazy. And also, you're not an imposter, like you, of anybody. I, I almost didn't do this podcast, but they sent me a message one day. I was having a hard day at work, and I was telling them about how I felt imposter syndrome and blah, blah, blah. I'm not good enough, blah, 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 blah. They were like this disqualifies you like you should be doing this <laughs> you should be doing mm -hmm. this podcast and then the the last thing that you had mentioned around boundaries in episode 15 on season one one of my old professors dr ruth white came on and talked about this concept of non-promotable work that is work that's not going to be valued by way of a promotion or by way of a salary boost or a bonus and that this type of work that needs to be done around the office, but that isn't going to get you that recognition is what's called non-promotable work. So that can be stuff like taking down the notes at meetings or mm -hmm. making the coffee in the morning or even being on these DEI committees that have all these battles and hurdles ahead of them. Um, and so she mentions that the time to have boundaries with those kinds of things isn't once you're already in them but before you even get started. So when you're hired in on a role and people are talking about maybe putting you on this committee, at that point, asking questions about like what's entailed and basically what's in it for me, you know, mm -hmm. um, before you start getting in the habit of making the coffee every morning, like who else is making the coffee? Um, who is paying for the coffee? What is this going to look like a year from now? Am I going to be resentful a year from now mm -hmm. that I've done all this work and now people expect me to be a secretary because it's like at home when you do the dishes, like 
a few times when you when you just start dating somebody and now all of a sudden it's your job to do dishes, like, am I going to be resentful in a year? So those are all great, great points. I want to ask you one final question, but before I do, why don't you let us know how we can find you on social media or your website so that listeners can get in touch? Yeah, so you all can follow me on, I'm mainly active on Instagram and LinkedIn. And you can find me there on at Autumn C. Walker. So Autumn, so just like the season, C, my cat, Walker. And you can also find me on Facebook. It's, it's in the slow developing stages, but we're getting around. But um, I'm on Facebook under the Soul Reasons. I will be there as well. And I also have a text messaging subscription in which you will be able to receive free therapist tips every Thursday on ways to overcome imposter syndrome and the anxiety attached to it. And okay. all you have to do, mm-hmm, I wanna, cause I really want to be able to build community. I'm really looking forward to connecting with folks offline and this is one of the best ways to do so. So you can text the word SOUL, S-O-U-L, to the phone number 206-647-0500. Awesome. I love that idea. I love it. So the last question that I want to ask you is a question that I'm trying to remember to ask every guest at the end of the show. And that is, what is the validating mantra or affirmation that you use either, you know, for a specific time period like now, or that really got you through something difficult? Yes. Yes. I think the mantra that's been, that first pops up in my my head right now, so I'm going to share, is all things work together for my good. This helps Mm -hmm. out with anxiety. This helps out with doubt. This helps to push past any fear of failure. This helps out with acceptance. Um, And it also gives me confidence to just do it because I'm going, it's going to work out for me either way, (laughs) either way, even if it doesn't look like the way that I intended or planned, it's going to, it's working out. It was a part of the plan. So all things work together for my good. It is a Bible scripture. It, It definitely has been one of the main mantras for sure and affirmations that's been pushing me through these last couple of quarters with the sole reasons and just even for personal for personal use as well. Well, thank you so much for joining us on Impostrix Podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Whitney. Thanks for your time and for this opportunity. I feel super duper honored and I hope that someone out there really, you know, was able to take away something today. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) All right, y'all. Until next time, be validated.